Welcome to the webinar, a checklist to ensure your presentations are a success. One of the keys to successful presentations, successful workshops, successful seminars is the level of preparation that people have done. The level of preparation around ensuring that everything is in place and one way to do this is to have a formal checklist or some steps that you go through before you present and when all the steps are in order you're pretty well guaranteed to do a great presentation. So that's what this webinar is about. My aim would be that all of you go away with two or three things from today that you can use for your next presentation. You can use to make it more successful, more confident and also more effective. So Peter Dews my name, I'm a public speaking trainer and coach and my passion is to help people find their voice, help people have the confidence, help people have the skill to put their message across. I think there's nothing worse than having something you'd like to say, something that you feel that you could contribute but holding back because you maybe lack confidence in standing up and speaking or maybe you just don't feel that you are that effective or you're not that good at public speaking. So my passion is helping people unlock their potential through their own spoken word so you can all share your, your knowledge and important experiences. Okay, people are still joining. We've only just got started. How to participate in webinars. Just in case you haven't been involved with one of my webinars before, please ask questions as we go. I do have a slide that says are there any questions, but you don't have to wait for that slide. Any time I say something that uh, triggers some thoughts or maybe you want explained, please, please ask questions. Two ways to ask questions. Number one, put your hand up and I will open up your microphone and then you can just ask the question. The second way is just type directly into the question and answer box and then I will be able to respond to that question immediately or I may delay it because I have the answer coming a bit later on in the webinar. But once you type in the question, I do have that there. When you put your hand up, I will basically pause and open up your microphone um, straight away. Please take notes. Uh, as I did say, this webinar I am recording and I will make available for everyone and sort of participate through questions but also comments and sometimes people say, you know, that they've in fact used this particular skill that I teach previously and this is, this is what happens. So feel free to participate. And I think most importantly is to think and apply some of the knowledge or some of the tools or skills I'm teaching in the webinar. Think and apply them to your own speaking situation. And it may be your most recent presentation, what you could have done differently, what you could have included, what you could have added that may have made that presentation more effective. Or think about a presentation you've got coming up. I'm coaching someone tomorrow who's got a wedding speech in early May. So think about those presentations you've got coming up. What can you practically and easily do from this webinar that would make your next presentation successful? Why have a checklist? Simply, the more preparation you do, the more polished, the more confident, the more credible your performance. And it was Robert Schuller who said spectacular performance is always preceded by spectacular preparation. Steve Jobs is often held up at those Apple conferences, is often held up as a shining light of a brilliant presenter. Steve Jobs used to lock himself away in a hotel room three days before every one of those annual Apple conferences. Three days preparation for a 45 minute to a one hour presentation with Steve Jobs level of preparation. Your checklist also 
helps you become more effective. We become what we repeatedly do. If you continually check off and make sure you've ticked all the boxes I'm going to share with you, then you will also be successful. And Winston Churchill, similar to Steve Jobs, was one hour per minute of speaking, one hour's preparation per minute of speaking. So that's why you have a checklist. It's going to help you with your performance, your confidence, your credibility. Let's get started. I'm briefly going to talk about the logistics checklist. Now I'm just going to change screens and I will email this checklist to you all. You should be looking at a Word document now. Now this is a broad based checklist. This checklist, I'll just make it a little bit bigger, this checklist you would choose what you need to do. Uh, I travel a lot. I have to make sure that I've got car hire organised, I've got to make sure I've got aeroplanes, tickets organised. I also use the the Mikey card in Melbourne that I don't carry around with me in Perth. Your mobile phone charges, your consumables, have you got a bottle of water, throat lozenges. When I speak a lot, I sometimes need to use my reliable butter menthol. Have you got a timer, a watch? So this is a complete checklist and not everything will apply. Is there going to be a microphone? If it's a small venue, maybe you don't need a microphone. If it's a conference, you probably need the AV technician to do the sound check and all that with you. This is a really comprehensive checklist that I will provide you. Going over the page, some other things before the workshop. Check in with the organiser regarding all your requirements, your room set up. Find out from your audience what their expectations are. Do a pre-workshop questionnaire. Are there any cultural things you have to be aware of? When I'm in Shepparton, I acknowledge the traditional landowners as the Yorta Yorta people. When I'm in Perth, it's the Noongar people. Has your catering been organised? After the workshop, follow up. Follow through with what you promised. So after this webinar, I need to send you the recording and I need to send you the PDF version of this document. Get feedback. What went well? What did not work well? At the end of every webinar, I invite feedback from people. Send me an email. If you've got any further questions, any comments, uh, anything I could do differently, please send me that email. So that's my logistics checklist. This workshop is not about that. But the logistics checklist is still worthwhile in terms of making sure you're ready to present. I went to Karatha recently had my laptop, had my data projector, had to supply my own data projector and in in the process of packing the data projector I l l left I left my power cords and the serial cable for my data projector at home in Perth. So all of a sudden I was had to present the next morning and I had no cables for my data protector. Luckily uh, Harvey Norman in Carrath was open and I went there and was able to buy a new cable and, and I was able to borrow a serial cable, a new cable that fitted my data projector. I could take the data projector in and they got the right one and I could borrow a serial cable. So yeah, that's why the checklist is important. I didn't follow my own rules around checklists. So this is the agenda. This is the 10 steps checklist. Have you got your nerves, your anxiety under control? Have you done the right level of preparation? And what do I mean by preparation? Is your speech structure set out in a simple and memorable way? Have you got some hooks and some persuasive aspects of your message? Are you in the right emotional space in terms of your attitude? Are you, not, are you aware of what your body language is doing, your eye contact, your gestures, your voice? 
have you prepared your voice ready for this presentation? Are you using the platform effectively? And part of your preparation will be knowing what sort of platform you're speaking on. Are all your audio visual? Are they organised? Your flip charts? And have you got the mode, a means of getting feedback? They're the 10 areas that if you just tick them off, you can be really confident that you've done a fairly effective presentation. So let me go through these and then I'll pause for questions. So step one, have you got your nerves under control? And it may vary depending on the size of the gig. So you've been invited to speak to a conference, a keynote speaker, you've got 250 people in the room and you're normally a workshop presenter. Have you got some quick relaxations ready? What happens if the speaker before you goes over your time or the video you're going to show does not work and you become a little bit anxious? What happens if someone asks you a really difficult question? Have you got some quick relaxations ready to use? Are you prepared for anything? So these are the contingencies some of which I just spoke about, the difficult question. Have you got your positive mindset? Uh, one of the things I do is I arrive early and I walk on the platform and I play over in my mind, I play over parts of my presentation, especially the key points, the opening and the conclusion, those key aspects. So I've got that positive mindset. Are you aware that your nerves and the level of your nerves don't impact on you as a presenter. Do you understand that if you've got a really high level of nerves, the audience only sees 50%? Can you rate yourself on your own anxiety or your own nervousness scale? What do you normally walk on stage with? I normally walk on out of 10, with 10 being high, one being low. I walk on six out of 10. And I'm happy with 6 out of 10, so I'm not free of nerves, nor do I want to be free of nerves. Sometimes I might go up to 7 out of 10, and it's a bigger gig, it's an important gig. I need to do some deep breathing. I need to do some quick relaxes so I can bring my anxiety level, my nerves, down to a 6 out of 10. Is there anything that triggers an increase in your own anxiety or your internal nervousness? Understand that and be aware of it. Have you got your nerves under control? Have you done the right level of preparation? This is the, the second step. So know your audience. What have you done to know your audience? I mentioned various Aboriginal groups. What are the different professions of the people in the group? Who was their previous speaker? What was the feedback from the previous speaker? What's that audience's vision? What's, if, it's a, if it's a corporate gig, what's their mission? Or what's the values of the people in that audience? Have you chosen the right language, the right stories to match that audience's values? Are there any uh, cultural nuances? Exchange of business cards, the two-handed business card, for the Japanese, the Indians, the Singaporean, the Malaysian, the Chinese. Someone gives you your uh, their business card with two hands, please don't grab it with one hand. Know your venue. Do you need a microphone? Is there a platform? How wide is the, is the platform? How deep? My normal use of a platform is three to four steps forward, but I don't want to do three or four steps forward and then be in someone's lap. So some venues I can only do two steps forward. I saw a really important conference in Sydney a few years ago where one of the presenters was in a wheelchair. Uh, his name was W Mitchell and I share you some share with you W Mitchell's video in my workshops. He was a keynote speaker. The platform was raised. No one had thought to put a ramp or a means of W. Mitchell to get on stage. So at the last moment as he's being introduced, he has to get four strong people from the audience to lift him up on the stage in his wheelchair. Uh, that could be the conference organizer's fault, but W. Mitchell could have also asked or checked, uh, do you have a platform for me to get up on the stage? So it's about knowing your venue. 
Know your contents, so this is your material. This is not winging it. Are you familiar with your content? Have you done the prior preparation? Have you done the Winston Churchill? Are you aware of difficult questions that could come? What if you're delivering bad news or contentious issues or new information? And there are going to be some hecklers. Make sure you know your content and know what you don't know. So don't make it up. Can you plug and play? So run these scenarios through yourself, through your mind. If the power goes off and there's enough sunlight for the auditorium to remain bathed in light, can you still deliver the presentation without your audio visual? If the speaker before you speaks 20 minutes into your one hour time, can you do your content in 40 minutes? That's plug and play. That means no matter what happens, there's a room change, there's a venue change at the last minute. So you're in a breakout session and you had the big room or you had the small room and the other speaker had the big room. All of a sudden your room is overflowing and the small room and the big room's only got 15 people and the conference organiser asks you to quickly swap rooms. Can you do that? This is plug and play. I was presenting at the Southwest Academy of Sports in Bunbury a while ago and they said there'd be about 10 or 15 people. I travelled down there and they said, look, we've had a better response than expected. There was 80 people in the room. Uh, do I say, look, I've only brought 15 handouts, I've only brought sort of 20 handouts. The way I work is with small groups. Um, I can't work with 80 people or do I still deliver my content to that 80 people? Plug and play. That's your preparation. When you know your audience, your venue, your content, and you can anticipate and plug and play, regardless of what happens, you've really eliminated all of what could go wrong with your presentation. Another plug and play very briefly. I was just working in Grafton and someone said, Peter, I did your workshop 12 months ago and I'm so glad you told me to learn my content and just anticipate everything. I was out presenting with a colleague one Monday morning and it was about half an hour before we were about to go on. I'd arrived at the venue nice and early as you said to and I got a phone call from my co-presenter and they said, look, I've just been involved with a motor vehicle accident. I'm fine, I'm fine but I won't be able to make it today. You need to present my content as well as your content. And this lady said that she could, but the only reason she could was because she had anticipated everything and over the weekend she had read the slides and the content of her co-presenter as well as her stuff. They both worked together, so it was a tag team presentation, but ordinarily she would have polished her stuff and relied on the other person to present her stuff. Can you plug and play? Speech structure. Those of you who have been to my workshop will be fairly familiar with this, but it's the first 30 seconds that's going to make a really big difference. It's called the rule of primacy. Have you got the attention grabber that gets them going in the first 30 seconds? And the rule of recency, this is your conclusion. Does your conclusion have impact? Have you got three simple points that you can remember? Is your core message clear? If people come up to you in six months time and say, thank you for your presentation, I loved, will they all say the same thing? Will everybody get your core message? That without a doubt, that unequivocal, the purpose that you presented. Is it relevant to your audience? And this comes back to the previous point, know your audience. Why do they care? Why does it matter to them? Some speakers when they speak are really passionate about their topics, but if the audience doesn't care or if it's not relevant to the audience, then they may not have the impact that they want. So you have to try and work out why is it relevant to the audience. And with your three points, that support your core message, have you got the right stories, the right case studies, the right anecdotes that support your 
three points. And you'll choose the stories based on your preparation, on knowing your audience, your pre-workshop questionnaire, the values of that audience, the professions, the careers of those audiences. You will use different stories. When I work with financial plan, I work with financial planners, I work with health professionals, I work with disability professionals. When I work with financial planners, my health stories do not always have impact and do not connect well with that particular audience of financial planners. My story about the difficulty of uh, me looking after my father's will after he died, after he died without a will, um, is the right story for the financial planners. Just in connecting with them and talking and presenting to them about how to be more effective in getting their message across. They understand that I've been through a financial planning process and one of the first things they will say to you is, have you got life insurance and then have you got a will? My father did not have a will. That story connects with them. So have you got the right stories that work well with that audience? Any questions? I'm going to pause for a moment and I'm going to have a, just, just have a moment for questions. Please type questions in or put your hand up and I'll open up your microphone. And there's one, one question, thank you, about, about knowing your audience. And I do understand that some audiences are mixed audiences and therefore you'll need to use mixed stories. You, you'll make, need to make sure that your message is relevant to a wide range of people. If your audience is all from one organisation and I work with Chevron and I work with BHP and I've worked with Rio Tinto and I've worked with the Health Department of WA and I've worked with Disability Services, uh, I've worked with Alzheimer's Association, those audiences I can really target my stories and I can really target my message. When you have an open workshop and you get a couple people from health and a couple people uh, that work within the Aboriginal sector and a couple of people that work with disabilities, then I need to use a mixture of stories, a mixture of, I guess, examples. The core message should still remain the same. So I may have to broaden my core message so that it's relevant to everyone. But in my mixed audiences, um, all of the people are there for the same purpose. They want to become more confident and more effective and they want to be able to change, make change within their their profession within their life and if you if you work as an Aboriginal health worker then you need to be able to be confident and speak to your community. Thanks for that question. Okay, please keep the questions coming. Have you got some hooks? Have you crafted a memorable, memorable message? One of the mistakes people do is they write a presentation they present it and then the audience walks away and thinks that was a nice presentation. And they don't remember anything or they don't do anything or they don't buy your message. So this is some hooks that you can do to make your, your message more persuasive. So what's in it for me if I'm listening to you? What's in it for me? How are you solving my problem? How are you helping me achieve my goals? That's hook number one. Hook number two, have you got one big message? And just some simple examples. If I say to you, Nike, Nike's one big message is just do it. If I said to you, uh, which bank? Most people will say Commonwealth Bank. 
So after you've spoken for 45 minutes, is there one big message that comes through? Barack Obama on his election night for his first election six years ago spoke for 45 minutes and said, yes, we can. You can use repetition to make sure people get that one big message all the way through. Ask them to do something. If you only do one thing, how are you going to incorporate this message? I need you all to lobby your local members of parliament. Ask them to do something. A lot of speakers just stop speaking. Don't stop speaking. Have a call to action. Use surprise, surprising statistics, something that's unexpected. This is sometimes called a violation to expectations and most good storytellers, they do have a twist or a violation. Make your data or your statistics concrete. And what do I mean by that? Some statistics are, are brilliant and they're very accurate but they're not memorable. So, for example, the human heart pumps 350 million litres of blood in an average lifetime. That's not very concrete, so 350 million litres, I want you all to go home tonight, turn on your kitchen tap, leave your tap running for 45 years. That is 350 million litres. I was at a, a presentation in, in Melbourne and I went, I went to the male uh, toilet and they've got these, these non-flushing, these, uh, these waterless urinals and they've got these, these microbes and these bacteria that, that break down the urine and create nice odours and save four swimming pools, four swimming pools full of water per year. I, th I think it was 169,000 litres. I can't remember. I, I do remember four swimming pools of water. Make your data concrete. Credibility, where does your credibility come from? You, where does your data come from? Your statistics, Australian Bureau of Statistics, World Health Organisation, previous employment, your qualifications, have you written a book? Are you a, a published author? What makes you credible? Put some of those hooks in there. Your own journey, your own struggle. As a person who stutters, I become quite credible when I help people overcome their fear of public speaking. They say, hang on a moment, here's a guy who stutters and stuttered badly and struggled to get through life and now he does public speaking for his career with his stutter. Wow, um, if he can do it, then I'm sure I can do it. And finally, use your story. People won't remember what you said, they'll remember how you made them feel. So your story can help transform people on an emotional, on an emotional journey. I've got a question. Do you have any tips when you are presenting to an executive group or a group of senior staff members? Make sure it's relevant for them. So for your, for your executives, what are their problems? Uh, they probably want to meet their shareholder expectations. They may want to meet their key performance indicators. They may want to reduce costs. They may want to increase return on investments. What is it that they want from you and how does your message address that issue? Give them something that they want. What's in it for me? If it's in terms of nerves, so all of a sudden you're you're above or you're presenting to a group above you, some executives, and you feel a little bit anxious and a little bit nervous, then once again do your level of preparation. So make sure that you know the content is what they want. One of the biggest problems is people speaking confidently, effectively, knowledgeably on something they're passionate about, but the audience doesn't want that, the audience is not interested. So be, make sure that your content is what the audience wants. Does everyone know that public speaking is not about you? Public speaking is about the audience. 
so have an impact on the audience. Please let me know if you have any further questions relating to speaking to senior staff. So you're speaking up and uh, yeah, I've, I've sort of extrapolated to around what you might mean. So there are some hooks. Every time you do a presentation, try and put one of those hooks into your presentation. Um, you're not going to put all of these, all seven, but which one are you going to use? So Barack Obama used one big message. Okay. Have you got the right attitude? What I mean by having the right attitude is are you passionate about what you're speaking on? And your passion is one of the most important things. An audience will buy a message from someone who's clearly in line with their message, who's clearly passionate. The other way to get the right attitude is think of the first date mentality. So what would you do when you go out on a first date? What are the extra things that you would do to make that date special? Or what can you do that lets the audience know they're special? And these are sometimes all called the one percenters. What can you do that lets your audience know that they're special? Your attitude needs to show. If you're passionate and you hold back, then why would people buy your message? With your attitude that shows, just be careful with your energy level. Your energy level should match that of the audience plus a little bit. If you come in too energised, then you will lose the audience. So think of the evangelical, rah, 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 American speakers and American preachers. Works really well in the United States. Sometimes when those speakers speak on the Australian circuit, they, they start off too energised and the audience is not ready for that level of energy. The reverse, of course, if the audience is is energised, they're anticipating some good news and some information and some, some valuable tools, maybe like you guys today, and I came in and was unenergised, really flat, just going through the motions, then I would drag you down and I'd have less impact. So part of your preparation should be to know what energy, what's the energy level of the room and I need to match it. Responsibility. You could change somebody's life, you could take somebody from a difficult spot, especially those people that speak and work in the area of uh, health and disability and mental health and even those people that work within the Aboriginal sector. When you get before an audience, recognise you have a responsibility to do a good job. People are investing time, sometimes they're investing money. You need to come across with that attitude that you are in a privileged position, so you need to attribute the right amount of responsibility that comes with that privilege. Do your attitudinal check. I've just come back from a 19-day trip. I mentioned Grafton, also Bendigo, Coffs Harbour, Mildura, Warrnambool, and it actually started in Perth, so 19 days of which I spoke for 15 days and there was some driving and some flying in between. Uh, around about day 10, day 11, it would have been easy for me to lose my passion, to lose that attitude, but every workshop I just made it in my mind that there's no place I'd rather be. I'm excited, I'm energised and I'm really pleased to be before this audience and I've got a responsibility and you have to be able to recreate that, that, that level of attitude. 
it's not just going through the motions. What's your body language, your eye contact, what are your gestures doing? And as I've said there, this is a one day workshop in its own right. This could be a one day workshop in its own right. Just a couple of quick tips and I have run a webinar on this uh, previously so I'm not going to spend a lot of time. Bouncy hands are annoying. You'll see our politicians sometimes and their hands will bounce up and down with each inflection of their voice and it's really important that we do not bounce our hands. The correct way is the frozen hand gesture. So you make your gesture and you just leave the hand there when you pause. And as you start to speak, you move to the next gestural position. People do all sorts of things with their fingers. They twiddle, they do gymnastics, they rub their palms, they turn their ring around and around, uh, they sort of lock their fingers and, and invert them back and forth. Make sure you keep your fingers nice and still unless it's an appropriate gesture. Maybe you're listing things, so you've got the first point, the second point and the third point. You might list those on respective fingers. But generally you, you don't need to do those, those gymnastics with your fingers. Do you understand when your palms are facing upwards when you're gesturing? That makes you very approachable. When your palms are facing down to the ground, that makes you appear and sound very credible. Sometimes in your presentation, you want to be approachable. You want to have those discussions. But other times, you want to give them the good oil. You want to give them the four steps. You want to give them the important facts. And if you do that with palms up, you're going to be lovely and approachable, but your credibility will suffer. Are your gestures in line with what you're saying? The bouncy gestures do not add value to what you're saying. They're not congruent. So your gestures need to echo. When you're talking about yourself, don't be afraid to point to yourself. And you guys out there would be aware, I'm now pointing outward to all of you. It's much better when the gestures represent what you're saying. And you don't have to gesture all the time. When you're not gesturing, your hands could be resting by your sides or across your belly button, parallel to the floor. Don't do the fig leaf, which is hands down around your crotch. Don't do the sergeant major, which is hands folded behind your back or the hands on hips or the crossed over. They're closed positions. The fig leaf is a passive position. It means I'm shy, I don't really want to be here. Are you familiar what your nonverbal communication is saying? Have a look in the mirror. Get the feedback. Look at your audience. Speak to them. You may be aware that only 10% of your message is in the words that you say. Around 10%. A third, 32%, 30% is in your voice, your sincerity. This is the passion. And 50, 60% is in your gestures and your body movement. So roughly half of your message, half of your ability to have impact is determined by your nonverbal communication and what your body's doing. So invest in checking what your eye contact and what your gestures are doing. This is worthwhile checking. Have I got the right gestures? 
have I got the right body language for this presentation? You probably know that Malcolm Gladwell did some research into job interviews and the first 15 seconds normally determines whether you have a job or not. Whether you're successful at job interview, the first 15 seconds. So this is your nonverbal communication. This is the walking in the room. This is how you walk, the confidence, not the fig leaf, but the confidence stance. This is the handshake with the three or four panel members, a few words saying hello and you know, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to, to stake my claim and 15 seconds is gone. That's your nonverbal communication speaking. Of course this assumes you've got the right qualifications and the right experience stacked up against someone else and then it's the first 15 seconds. The interview panel's already made up their mind whether you are number one or you're number two or you're number three first 15 seconds. I don't have time to go into the science behind this, but worthwhile investing in knowing about your nonverbal communication, your checklist. You can find out a little bit more about body language from quite a few textbooks. Alan and Barbara Peace are probably Australian experts and they've written quite a few body language uh, textbooks. Check what your hands are doing in the mirror. I'm just going to pause for a moment. Any questions? Once again, put your hand up or type directly in the dialog box as last time. So question about the job interview, surely that can't be possible. What they did was they they interviewed They went to some job interviews and part of the interview process was the interview panel at the end of the one hour job interview rated each applicant, each applicant on eight soft skills, eight personality traits, eight interpersonal skills and these were like um, reliability, honesty, uh, integrity, those kinds of things that, that people had to rate. So it's not your, your qualifications, um, it's not your have you had 15 years experience in marketing, it was those other interpersonal soft skills that employers are employing more and more on. Um, you can train technical skills, it's really difficult to train in interpersonal skills, it's really difficult to train in emotional intelligence. It is okay to train in IQ or, or technical skills, so people are looking for that. So that's one hour interview. You've rated people on those eight personality traits. They video record the first 15 seconds. In fact, they video record the whole one hour interview. They splice off the first 15 seconds and go down to Hay Street Mall, Burke Street Mall, Pitt Street Mall in Sydney and then show that 15 seconds of video to 20 people randomly in the street and give them the same rating scale and ask them to rate that video. The correlation was 80%. The people in the street that saw 15 seconds got 80% correlation with the scores that the people that spent one hour in the job interview. So that's where the research comes from. Brilliant. Okay. Moving on, how are you using your voice? And it's really about pause and not speaking too fast. Pause is a valuable tool for creating suspense. If you want to use, if you want to hear great use of pause, watch the next time Barack Obama speaks. The pace, if you don't have great intonation, then sometimes you speak fast, sometimes you speak slow. Your pitch, the intonation, this is the rise and fall, the volume. So I can speak a little bit faster, I can also speak a little bit slower, but I can increase my volume and I can also soften my volume. One of the things that I show people 
when I'm doing workshops is when they're brainstorming and when they're talking and I want them back, don't raise your voice. If you raise your voice, okay, can everybody come back? The whole room raises its voice. Instead, you lower your voice. So you start to whisper and people see that you're talking and then all of a sudden the, the volume of the room comes down. So you can use your volume to also create impact. Do you need a microphone? And this is part of your preparation. How big is the room? Walk the platform first. When you speak without a micro microphone, have someone standing up the back. Can you hear me? If the answer is loud and clear, you probably don't need a microphone. If the answer is yes, I can hear you, but only just. Now that when you fill that room with people, you probably do need a microphone. Drink lots of fluids. Uh, avoid milk, avoid soy, so flat white soy lattes should be off the drinking list before speaking and drink apple juice or drink pineapple juice or um, not orange juice but and, and lots of water. Are you using the platform effectively? Once again, you've walked the platform earlier, part of your preparation, know the venue or you've sent an email to the organiser can you give me the dimensions of the lectern? Uh, how many steps up? How many feet forward? Uh, how many people will be in the room? Where is the where is the data projector and the data projector screen? Can you present without standing behind a lectern? Do you know how to use the platform? That means move across the stage. Do you know about spatial anchoring? Point one is in one aspect of the stage, point two is in another position, and point three is in a third position. And then throughout your one hour presentation, every time you refer to that point, you go back to that position, that spatially anchored position in the stage. Do you know about past, present, future? Do you know that the middle centre of the stage is the strongest point to speak from? but don't deal with difficult stuff there. Don't deal with difficult questions. Step back and off to one side. That's called decontamination. Leave your centre of the stage clean for your take-home messages for your strong points. Difficult question, then you move back and off to one side. It's a really good point. Look, I don't agree with you. Da -da -da. Deal with that and then move back to your position of influence and move forward a little bit just to make that stronger point and then step back to the middle of the stage. Do you stand behind a lectern or behind a table? Are you using the platform effectively? Are you creating a brilliant adult learning experience by effective use of the platform? Probably a whole webinar on just using the platform. Uh, the amazing things that you can do from the platform to engage the audience, to help them remember your messages. Your audio visuals, your slides, no bullet points in PowerPoint. Does everybody know that bullet points are gone? Uh, bullet points in PowerPoint presentations are shooting your audience to death one bullet at a time. You may have noticed in my webinars, those of you who have attended before, I do not do bullet points. Models, cartoons, graphs are hierarchical structures. Eliminate the noise. What do I mean by noise? Well, there is there is the literal noise, which is the you know the kachings and the pings and and the and the noises. But there's also the visual noise, so the bouncing as a, as a point bounces across. Along the bottom, your website or your corporate logo on every slide, your page number, page five of 65 slides. You need your slides to stand out and pop. So eliminate the noise. Use graphs, photos, models, cartoons. Blacken your slides in between. So what do I mean by blacken your slides in between? Some of you will know the B button on your keyboard will just data project black light. 
So some people say, Peter, you said to leave the lectern and move into the middle of the room, but I can't because I'm data projecting. Let me show you what happens when I hit the B button on my keypad. Let me show you what happens when I hit the B button on my keypad. And it's not going to work today. There we go. Let me hit the B button again and it comes back. So black your slides in between. All that means is you've shown some data, you've shown a graph, you've shown a picture, you've shown a model. Now you want to talk about it. So you black the slide, you now move into the middle of the platform. And people's eyes are now on you as opposed to the PowerPoint. One of the mistakes people do is they leave their PowerPoint slides up and they move on to a different point or a different topic or the discussion goes somewhere else. But once again, the audio-visual, the PowerPoint slide is not in line with what they're talking about. So practice and learn how to black your slides. Use your flip charts and, and use your whiteboard. Do you need those? Have you got whiteboard pens? Have you got flip chart pens? Do you need to bring your own butcher's paper? I carry around um, some sticky back flip chart that I get from Officeworks. It's A1 size, so it's not quite as big as butcher's paper, and I carry around a couple of uh, big bulldog clips. So if I go to a venue and there is no flip chart or butcher's paper, then I can then just clip this flip chart to the whiteboard because I always insist on a whiteboard when I present and I can then write on the flip chart and I can then tear it off and stick it on the on the wall so that people can then take a photograph of that later on or refer to it. Do you need to bring any props? I bring my favourite books in terms of public speaking and I share them with people and then sometimes I'll talk about a particular aspect like the first 30 seconds rule the rule of primacy and Milo Frank, I've got Milo Frank's book which is how to have impact in 30 seconds and I show them that book and, and this is where that concept comes from. So bring props along if you need them. Have you got everything you need from an audio visual perspective? How will you receive feedback? This is the final checklist. And Ken Blanchard from the One Minute Manager said, champions eat feedback for breakfast. Feedback is the food of champions. Every time you speak, can I encourage you to get feedback? That is how you grow. Those of you who've been to my workshops, you know that I always send out a post-workshop questionnaire. Make sure your feedback is specific, so I send that email immediately and I ask for specific feedback. It needs to be immediate, it needs to be honest. So in terms of specific, that means don't ask people how did I go because they may say to you that you went really well or they may say to you, well, yeah, you didn't do too good, Peter. How do you change? How do you improve? How do you use that feedback? Yeah, that went really well. How do you use that feedback as a continuous improvement tool? You can't. So maybe my aim is to um, eliminate um, some of the filler words that um, I use too frequently in um, my presentation. Can you specifically count my ums for me um, in the first five minutes? Um? And please don't tell me in six months' time that you counted 15 ums. I need to know immediately. And I've given you permission to be honest. Use an audience member, use audience members, someone you trust, someone that arrived early that you shook hands with. I've said use a mirror, good for your nonverbal communication, don't be afraid to video, record yourself. 
most people have smartphones nowadays, just get someone in the audience or the MC or someone you trust, just to video record maybe five minutes, your five minute introduction. Then you can look at how well you're going. You can look at those filler words, those distractions, are your hands bouncing? Join a Toastmasters club. Whenever you speak in a Toastmasters club or indeed a rostrum club, which are both public speaking clubs, everyone who speaks gets feedback. In your checklist, how are you getting feedback for every presentation? It's the only way we grow. So that's my 10 step checklist. Some of the stuff that I presented there, each one could be a one day workshop. Some of you have been to my workshops and I've also got my workshops available online. So I now have an online self paced uh, learning environment with videos, with webinars, with PowerPoint presentations, with questions after each module and answers. If anyone's interested in either of those presentation skills or thinking and speaking off the cuff, just send me an email. The exact content that I run in a one day workshop I've turned into uh, five times one hour videos plus support material plus other resources so you can run these at your own pace. And if there's some areas around how to use the platform, how to use your voice or nonverbal communication that you feel you'd like more information on and you're not able to attend one of the live workshops, some of this information would be helpful to you. My workshops, I've got some upcoming workshops if you did want to go to live workshops and I'll just share with you my, uh, my website. 30th of April we've got presentation skills in Perth then assertive communication skills. Melbourne June 6th assertive communication skills. Caratha I've got presentation skills in May. You'll find all that information on my website if you are interested and of course feel free to email me uh, if you felt that an in-house workshop would be of value then by all means please um, please do contact me via my website or via my email. Any final questions before I wrap up the webinar? I will make this recording available and I will send you that logistical checklist, bearing in mind the key to this webinar in terms of your checklist was to go a little bit deeper than just the, just the logistics. Thanks for your participation.